Hey, everybody. Welcome to Old Fashioned Catholics. I'm Nick. I'm Kevin. And we are Catholics who like to drink old fashions. Um, if you are just tuning in for the first time, we are just a couple of Catholic guys who are dads and husbands, and we like to stay up late. We always record really late at night um, because that's when you get free time in your when you're in your vocation. Uh, so welcome. Welcome, welcome. We're glad you could join us. If you'd like to join along with a beverage in hand, we welcome you to do so. Alcoholic or non doesn't matter to us. We'll put what we're drinking up on the screen. I am drinking an old fashioned tonight. And so is Nick, it looks like. So we'll, we'll put that up on the screen and you can pause it now if you'd like to get your own. Welcome back. I need to explain why there are two. Um, so the other, <laughs> the other night, I um, it's been it? a long day. It's a long day. So the other night, I saw this. Is it backwards or no? Anyway, salty caramel. Not to me. Salty caramel whiskey. Wait, 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 wait. Yep. Backwards. There you yeah, go. it's backwards now. <laughs> I think this probably would be backwards. But anyway, salted caramel whiskey. I got it and I don't know. I was just bored and poured it into a glass and it was just the most amazing thing. You don't need ice or anything. It's just wonderful. It tastes amazing. Um, and so then, um, and that was like last week, my in-laws were here and my father-in-law liked it and he had some and whatever. And so then I was going to buy another bottle. So I went there and it's bottom shelf. It's, so I reached down, I grabbed one, I got home and I poured a little bit I tasted it and I'm like, that's not right. That's not right at all. That's not. And then, so I looked at the bottle and this one actually says peanut butter whiskey. They, they look the same, except for this is not salted caramel, it's peanut butter. And so then you have this whole big bottle of peanut butter. So I Googled peanut butter whiskey cocktails and they said, you should make a peanut butter and jelly old fashioned. And so I did. And that's, so I made one. And Jason thought it tasted good. And I made one just so I could tell the story. And I'm going to drink it. But um, then I also made a salted caramel old fashioned because that's what we're really going for. So that's what I have. It's really interesting because the salted caramel, when you first started describing it, it sounds like it would be disgusting. But yeah. then you're describing how it's not just you who really likes it. And then you got the peanut butter one. And yeah. it in fact, sounds like it is maybe disgusting. Yeah, I don't want to. It's just, I don't think peanut butter is supposed to, I mean, I don't know. Sorry. Remember when you lived on the island, I remember having peanut butter punch, they called it. Uh-huh, yep. Which this is seemed similar. to be made with just straight up peanuts and whiskey <laughs> or, or rum. It was like, this tastes like rum and yeah. ground up peanuts, but that's, I loved it. That's what it was. <laughs> it was tasty on the island. This isn't, this yeah. isn't bad. It's just not. That was good. By the way, you look like you're on an island. What's it? What do you? What's this? Yeah, it's the night. Ooh, <laughs> I I couldn't resist the background because uh, it was allowing me to do it, and I thought it'd be funny. And this was a picture I took of the moon over the lake uh, the other night. Man, lake that's Superior. awesome. Where were you? Is that? I was on the South Shore. There's uh, uh, a lot of cool stuff along the South Shore, Lake Superior, huh. um, in Wisconsin. So I was there with family. Took this picture. And it was amazing. So that's yeah, beautiful. that's why I got the the night mode in the background tonight. I kind of I kind of like the background. It makes my hair do funny things. Yeah, your hair looks cool. And if you move your hands a lot, it's like you have some sort of white, like magic with you. And your shirt's dark. It's just like a oh, don't do that face. So you have a you have an old fashioned that you made with the salted caramel whiskey. And you have an old fashioned that you made with the nasty poop butt whiskey. Yep. And so you're going to drink the gross one first so that you can yes. end with the good one. Yep. And it um, probably won't take long. Even smelling it, I'm like, ugh. But this stuff, so the other stuff, just this, the salted caramel stuff, I just had it in the glass again. Nothing, just just some of that in the glass. And I walked into the bedroom. Jason was getting into bed and she's like, oh, what's that you're drinking? And it smells like a candle. And um, yeah, she even liked it. So. You know it's good if Jacelyn, because she doesn't really like much alcohol at all. So I'm going to drink this nastiness first. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I love it. It is well, good with the... I apologize. Uh, for those of you who did pause it and copied Nick's peanut butter drink, you're now also finding out how gross it is. So <laughs> you're you welcome. A, you get to do a spit take. We will have it on there. Um, 
they're both equally the same, just with the different. I suppose you're supposed to say it. Are you supposed to say the ingredients so Jesse can put them up? Well, we'll just tell Jesse what they are. All right, we'll tell him. Yeah. We, won't, we won't waste your time, ladies and gentlemen. You already read it, anyways, on the screen. Yeah. Oh, that's Jesse, true. This is now the past. This is time. This is tenet. I don't know what that means. What? The latest movie by Christopher Nolan, Tenet. Oh, sorry. Not sure. Oh. The only movie that I know about right now is A Quiet Place 2 that I really want to see. Yeah. Christian saw it the other day. I haven't seen it. Christian saw it with my sister, and he said, it had a couple of jump scares. That was yeah, all he said. It's, it's, it's lost on kids. It is a movie yeah. for parents. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, he said that about the first one, right? That, that dude, was, the first one, the first one rocked us, man. Mm -hmm. It was it was terrible, terrifying, and beautiful, and just so many things. It should have been rated like NC-21 if you're a parent with small yeah, kids. No, I know. No, I, know. I remember the because the kids didn't, uh, not my kids, Christian, he didn't really care. He thought it was dumb that the dad died or whatever. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. Like, <laughs> Jim Helpert does the thing he needs to do. and but. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm just drinking my regular okay. uh, brandy, old fashioned, Northwood style with uh, maple syrup tonight. Maple syrup. Um, I've started mixing my bitters because I'm too lazy to cut up an orange. I have orange bitters and then regular bitters. Ah, nice. <laughs> just do a little orange flavor. I think you're supposed to do that, right? I don't know. That's not lazy. If you don't want to cut an orange. It's not lazy. It's not lazy. I've never seen orange bitters in my life. Just enjoy it. You're on the top, man. You're living. They sell the them top. right next to the regular Angostura. Not up here in the north of the north, they don't. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I know that we want to talk about suffering tonight. Yes, yes we do. Tonight's video is on suffering. And there are a ton of videos on YouTube about suffering from people way more brilliant than you and I. Yeah. Uh, such as Father Mike. And I'm sure Bishop Barron has a video on suffering. And yeah. I bet... Um, uh, you know, Christopher West has something on suffering. I oh, bet Matt Brad has something on suffering. I'm Don sure Han has one. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, and they're all brilliant. But our take is going to be totally different because um, we're just going to talk about it experientially, not necessarily catechetically. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and it's fine to to be one more video out there. It's no big deal. That's I think that's what the YouTube is about: being one more video out there. Yeah. So, yeah. It all goes back to this rap song I heard about 15 years ago from the rapping priest, Father Stan Fortuna. Yeah, yeah you know you gotta suffer. And it's just his refrain. Yeah, you know you gotta suffer. And he's just <laughs> rapping about, you know you gotta suffer. I wonder what happened to that guy. I don't know. I haven't heard from him in a long time. Well, I hope he's still priesting somewhere. Yeah, probably. He might not be rapping anymore. but That'd be okay. Yeah, that'd be fine. It's kind of yeah, fine. It's if, less important than the, than the priesthood. Yeah, if you had to part. choose, if Father, if you're listening, if you had to choose one, choose the priesting. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Absolutely. Wasn't yeah. he like from the Bronx? Yeah. Well, wasn't he one of the CFRs or whatever? Or maybe he I, wasn't. I don't uh, know. I thought that he was, but I haven't met him. I've met some CFRs, but not him. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so we started talking about suffering because one night when we got done recording, not many people know this, but when we get done recording, we often talk longer. Um, and our B sides are better. And so we thought, well, we, we started <laughs> riffing about that. And so we thought we would try to cover it and we did record an episode on suffering and then uh, the, the audio was bad and we were pretty tired. We, we was a lot of just like, yeah. So we didn't air that one. So we did want to cover it tonight and do it. Like sometimes we just stumble <laughs> into our topics, but tonight we, we kind of, we both came prepared because we did. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And we've already recorded it, but it's going to be totally different because I don't remember what we said. In that I know. Class. I listened to it the other day, and it, we, we're not going to say any of the same stuff because it was really late. Gotcha. Gotcha. I'm going to keep trying to get this down because it's peanut butter. Well, what's your initial thought? What okay. jumps start the conversation? Well, I don't remember in the video how we got like uh, into the suffering idea, but somewhere along the way, we just started like we were we were just talking about the fact that um, that. It seems to be, and this is us, like this is us just talking. Um, that it seemed to us at the time that, in one way or another, suffering suffering was inevitable. Um, 
in life. Um, and, and you, like we often think, well, Jesus came um, and he suffered so that we wouldn't have to, but then you, there are plenty of scriptures where that's not true. We're supposed to pay, take up our cross and follow him. And in this world, you will have trouble. And um, Paul is making up what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. Like all those, like that, there are mentions, mentionings after Jesus about embracing that idea of suffering. And you see that the disciples did it. And so it seems to, we, what, what started it was, it just seemed to us that it's almost like there's this freight train coming and it, it is that of in some way um enduring suffering um bearing bearing weight i guess is the way it seems and it's there's a reckoning in in so many things in life and that it's going to happen one way or another and so we were talking about like okay if it's inevitable then then how do we approach it how do we can we can we pre-approach it can you get there early like how do you how do you actively pursue it or welcome it or, or lean into it. Um, and that's what kind of got us started. Um, and then, so then we did our episode and then it was a little few days later, a few days ago, Kevin called me. He was like, I actually was reading the Bible and I read this first. So I, maybe you could at least, unless there's something else, do you want to start or is there another thought? Yeah, I'll just, I'll pull them out. So I uh, was reading first Peter, not to stumble across suffering, but realizing that it is so scriptural and it hits home the point of what you just said that um to me it, it also seems like uh well, are you still there yeah oh, there i lost you. you but we heard uh, you uh it it also seems like yeah it is a freight train that's coming and that thought has come from a place of thinking back on my life and just going oh man i've met people who have suffered so greatly and there's people I know who have suffered so greatly and have suffered so well. And there's also people I've seen suffer so greatly that it's completely pointless and meaningless. And then yeah. somebody dies and then life just goes on. And in a sense, suffering isn't the point of our lives, but it is a point. It, it is right. in a sense, the point of our lives to suffer and I got to that thought based on this in first Peter where it says, okay, so since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same thought for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer by human passions, but by the will of God, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal, which comes upon you to prove you as though something strange were happening to you. Rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will do right and entrust their souls to a faithful creator. Right. That's it. So that's like everything. It's like the best part. It, not, it's all great. My favorite line is, do not be surprised as if something strange were happening to you. Yeah. In other words... 99.9% .9 of all of humans who lived throughout history suffered all the time. Life right. was just full of suffering. People right. just, I said this in a different video, like your kid just got sick and died yeah. much more often than we were, are used to. And people, you know, there's people out there who have experienced that. And I don't know how people go through that, but yeah. In a sense, all of the world has dealt with this problem of suffering. And now it seems as though everything around me just wants me to try and avoid suffering. And even in me wants to avoid suffering as long as possible. I right. know, I know that it's real. I know that we have to suffer. I know that we have to die, but I just don't want it to happen to me. I just right. don't want it to happen right. yet kind of thing. Cause I've avoided, I've avoided uh, major suffering in other words god has spared me so if he spared me from so much suffering that he hasn't spared other people from uh peter's telling me it's coming right <laughs> like, don't be surprised it's not strange it's gonna happen and it might hit you like a freight train like you said so that's my initial thought on it yeah that's so huge like just that i yeah man just that idea that um for us, it is so difficult. For, for anyone listening to a YouTube video, odds are, especially if you're listening to in the States, now, just being in the States doesn't negate suffering and we all have emotional and some people have intense pain. But as a state of life, like the relatively poor in the States are still better off than, you know, 
so many people in the world, places that we've lived and are trying to move to, like, we just don't know daily suffering at the same, like it's, even if you're somebody who is currently struggling, like say you have a chronic disease or a chronic pain or something, like it's, you're not still bathed in suffering. You individually are suffering, but you're not like surrounded by the poor. You're not a third world country. You're not It's not everybody. We all kind of, we're, we easily get this idea that we can avoid it, like that we can. Like, no, actually, I'm I, I'm an American. And generally, I'm going to be able to live my life till I'm 90 and it's going to be just fine. I mean, barring some you know, random cancer or something, I'm just going to be able to push through it. And if I work real hard at it, I can avoid it as much as possible. And it seems like Paul's get or one of the things anyway that Paul's getting at is that just like, well, don't be surprised though. Like as if you weren't going to, um, it's just in one way or another, you're going to encounter it. And I think part of it we had talked about the other day was the fact that, because when Jesus came and he's the perfect human and he never did get sick and he wasn't going to get cancer and he wasn't going to, you know, experience those kind of things the same way we were, he still suffered the greatest. Like here, the, the perfect, the one who none of that happened to by his choice, everything happened to him. Like it all happened to him. And so if, as if that weren't enough, then we're told in scripture then to, to follow him in that, to take up our own cross. Like, and he's, he's referencing his own death, in that way of like, no, I'm going to bear the world's sins. So then you do the same. You pick your, you know, you follow in his steps type thing. Um, so I think that's, yeah, that seems to be that in one way, well, okay, two things. One, in one way or another, it's going to happen. But, um, and we. Yeah. And, and it's because if Christ did it, our right. lives are, we're made in God's image. So if Christ's model of life is to choose to suffer and die, then I ain't going to escape it. And neither right. is you, man. Right. And in any area, when it comes to like, because we talk about it all the time when it comes to like, you know, temptation and whatnot, like, no, you, you just, you crucify the flesh. But it seems to be in every area. Um, I've heard Father Mike talk about this and I, he got it from somebody, but just the fact that like after, after the fall, then love required sacrifice. I mean, love itself required sacrifice so there was pain in childbirth and like for anything good to come from the earth you had sweat of your brow and um and then for jesus like the catechism i think i've probably mentioned it on a ton of shows but the catechism talks about you know for the great the worst moral moment in all of history when they killed god became the greatest moral moment in all of eternity because it brought redemption and it was all because he had offered it it was chosen it was it was the worst moment but it because of his you know, free offering of self, it became redemptive. And then, so then that's where, you know, you always get the videos when you see the videos with, you know, Bishop Barron and stuff, they're talking about redemptive suffering. That's that idea. It's like, okay, instead of running from it, like we're like, we want to inside and like everything outside of us says, um, instead of running from it, then, then you find ways in the smallest and in the biggest to actively embrace it when it comes. Yeah. Um, let's, let's talk about that idea for a second, because, um, that terminology might be unclear to, you, you know, many people. And if you're listening, you know, he mentioned redemptive suffering. Let's talk about the Catholic idea of suffering. So uh, our premises here are that uh, suffering is inevitable. We're all going to have to go through it necessarily because Jesus went through it and our lives are to be modeled after his. And uh, we'll get to this in a little bit. We can either find small ways to choose it to, uh, strengthen that muscle in us and prepare ourselves for, uh, you know, real suffering, or it's going to be placed upon us or both. Right. And these are our premises. But when we talk about suffering from a Catholic perspective, what we really mean is that um, when we suffer, which will come or has come or is coming, the Catholic viewpoint is that we entrust our souls so entrust our very being to God through that suffering. Um, you've heard maybe the common phrase is offer it up. Yeah. Um, or if, I believe as Fulton Sheen has said, hospitals are filled with wasted suffering in that yeah. we believe as Catholics that when we suffer, we have the ability to make an act of our will to God to use that suffering for someone else in our life, to use that suffering for those who are closest to us and to use that suffering to redeem us, to bring us to heaven um, through suffering, which God is very clear about. 
And it's so crazy because that's like multifaceted because then yeah. by that choosing to offer it, look like all the levels that get impacted, you internally get, you know, sanctified, you get brought closer to God. Um, and then the world around you that you offer it up for, you can unite it with sufferings. Then the world is, you know, the, the body of Christ is brought in, you know, closer community and then closer to God. That's insane. That's amazing. Well, and, and oh, good. I was just going to say, and it's so powerful. Because suffering, if it has that power to bring us to all of those things that you just mentioned, it also has the power to destroy us. Suffering has the power to cause us to completely turtle or turn in on ourselves or turn away from God. So it can go either way. And um, the Catholic viewpoint is, okay, we entrust it to God and let him use his suffering for our good and for the good of others. The flip side, the converse is... Um, our suffering gets wasted. Either we think that it's meaningless or we let it be meaningless by doing nothing with it or turning bitter or angry. Um, you know, I know of someone who, uh, you know, there's no faith in their family and the husband uh, got cancer and slowly died. And it was just, it was simply just, he got sicker and sicker and then he died and they had like this funeral service and then just like, life moved on yeah. you know and they were obviously very broken and and sad and distraught and all of that but there was just nothing meaningful about yeah. it for them at all it didn't mean anything it's just this is a part of life yeah yeah i was at a funeral once where um um somebody had passed away suddenly and the the grandparent uh, the older, like yeah, the other grandparent was giving the sermon at the, the funeral, and he started it and ended it and punctuated it with, "This is a cursed world," and then he would go on and then he would come back to that, and it was just utter weight and brokenness with no, no hope, no, no way to like you have this thing, this suffering in front of you, and you just have no way to make sense of it. Um, because of that, because there was no specific uh, key to that. And it seems to be that that's, if, if Christ by his willful offering of himself can take this wretched, like the most wretched moment, um, and it becomes just the thing that we wear on necklaces and we have all over our stuff because it's the thing. It's the, why do we, why do that? Because it's the thing, it's everything. It's, it's the entirety, like then, <laughs> if that offering of it, that's like the key then is that like embracing of it and offering of self, it just, it only God could do that, but he fundamentally like flips it on its head and makes it exactly the opposite of what pain was intending. Like it's intending to, and I bet the enemy would have it crush, but, but we could see over and over that when you embrace it, then it actually, it builds up, it enlivens, um, which is just something only God can do. And that's why Paul talks about like in his sufferings, he's making up what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. It's not that Christ's act on the cross was inadequate. It's that uh, it was John Paul II said that he in his love offers us a tiny splinter of his cross. Like he offers us like a speck of the, his suffering, you know, in us when we, when we suffer for him, you know, like, and, and then if you don't think it's a surprise, if you're just like, no, yeah, that was, this is going to happen. This was always going to happen. Everything does change. Um, yeah. Yeah. It will. It can, it can, it can change. It can change. But I think there comes the point of the necessity of preparing for it. And, you know, how do you prepare for suffering? It's, it's not really difficult to even think about. I think, I wish Catholics got it the way that, or I wish we understood it the way that we understand athletes view of it. Everybody gets the suffering that Olympic athletes go through right. the punishment that they put their bodies through or professional athletes of any kind, the sacrifice that they make with their time, with their diet, with their family, the suffering that they endure physically and mentally and emotionally, especially people who do endurance type sports, they go through intense mm. forms of suffering to get a really good time on a race or to place really well at the CrossFit games, yeah. like just insane suffering in order to get this achievement. Um, and it's not really a hard leap to say, well, if, if 
the spiritual life is real, therefore, then I should be preparing for the suffering that has to come because God right. said it's going to come by suffering in little ways by choice, which is the logic of Lent right there. Right. That's right. the whole logic of Lent, which we set a time, you know, in our church, just one time a year, we set it apart for that. But we're supposed to be doing that all the time in right. certain ways. And, well, and it can be little. I, I think you do things like that uh, in your own life throughout your week. You've talked think, about that before. Yeah, I think everybody in some way or another does. Like it, even I, it's because it's a podcast or a channel about, you know, dads or parents. Like every parent has, uh, today we were out to eat and I just ordered a order of onion rings. That's all I, I just wanted this little batch of onion rings. And in, while I was eating them at separate times, Hudson and Davey both came up and were like wanting to take my onion rings. And I wanted to be like, we, we ordered you your own meal and I haven't once taken anything off your plate. Just let me have my onion rings. And like, <laughs> I was cognizant because I've, I've been having a bad attitude lately and I was cognizant of it that like, you better not deny your kid an onion ring like you, you, <laughs> nick like you better not tell your kid they can't eat your onion ring because that's so petty and so you're the one who only ordered onion rings if you were still hungry you should have ordered something bigger and um but yet for me it, it was an actual moment where i had to like internally be like i'm not gonna be that guy i'm not gonna <laughs> I'm not gonna be because I wanted to be that guy so bad. I just wanted to be like, you'll be fine. We'll give you a snack when we get home. I'm gonna eat my onion rings. But do right there. And you caught the moment and you you realized what you wanted to do. But how many of those other moments do you miss? And those I all miss. end up and, in confession. Yeah. And all of us watching and everybody's watching, we so often would take the no, you have your own food, let me have my onion rings route with yeah. whatever the situation is. Um instead of suffering just a little bit. Um, and it's a habit. It's, it's habitual, right? Yeah, yeah. We're just so bet. used to, no, this is mine. Well, and I would be, I guess I can't be willing to bet. I'll bet a lot of people who listen to us probably haven't known like lifelong suffering. Haven't known, because not many people have. Like it's it's more rare to have like the deep suffering we're talking about or, or just incredible loss um some of you might and it's not i you, you know us we're not i'm not negating that but for the most part for the most part we don't suffer in that way on a regular basis and so there's there is a responsibility on us i i believe and it seems to be and there's a, a catechism paragraph i want to read but it seems to be it's incumbent on us then to to okay then there are people around us who are suffering can I, through choosing, alleviate their suffering? There's, there's this book, two things. There's this book, um, uh, Descent into Hell by Charles Williams. Charles Williams was an author. He wrote with C.S. Lewis and Tolkien. They were all part of the group called the Inklings. He was one of the writers. And he has this book. I read this in college. So this is like way before Catholicism. But he, um, I have it downstairs. I saw it yesterday. He wrote this amazing book about this guy, um, uh, I guess uh, there's a bunch of plot lines. The one that matters for this topic is there's a, uh, a woman who consistently, when she is walking home at night in the dark, she sees herself, her doppelganger. And it's, it's more of a mystical, like she knows it's her somehow. And it brings this terror to her. And she's telling this friend of hers, um, Paul, she's saying like, I'm scared to go home tonight um, from this community center that they're in because I didn't told anybody, but I keep seeing myself and there's a terror there. And that's beside the point. But then the guy, Paul says, well, can you do me a favor? Um, when you leave tonight, I'm going to be scared for you. And she's like, well, that's absurd. <laughs> like you can't, you can't do that for me. And he's like, well, um, I, I think that I can. I, do you think that when the scripture tells us to bear one another's burdens, it just means in some pithy, you know, metaphorical way? And she said, well, no, that's the scriptures. Okay, well then, if you're carrying a, par a package and I say, can I carry that for you? You're not carrying it anymore, right? I am. And she says, yeah. He says, okay, well then when you leave, when you walk out this door, I'm going to go upstairs and I'm going to be scared for you. And she's like, all right, I just want this conversation to be over. And so she humors him and she walks out the door and Paul goes upstairs and he kneels down and he's overwhelmed with terror. And she walks home in peace. 
And it's this idea that he, he believed the scripture so much that he, he knew, okay, if she has fear, I can bear that. I can be afraid whoa, for whoa, her. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So yeah. <laughs> do you, th- I've never heard of anybody doing that in real life. Do you think it's possible to do that for someone in that way? I, for God to like send I, it here? I do. Yeah, I do. Otherwise we wouldn't have been told to do it. Now, do we know as quantitative, quantitatively as he did? Like, cause later in the book, she tells him like, I'm free. Like whatever you did, I'm like, do we get that? No, I think that's part of reading a novel. We don't, Yeah, yeah, sure. we want the payoff. We want to know, okay, but who and where did I bear? Um, but so one is that I, um, I used to get migraines all the time. And you've known me actually when I used to get them. Um, and I used to, in the midst of like t- a two day migraine, no, oh, I lost it. You're back. In the midst of a two day migraine, I used to try to just say, okay, well, somebody out there might have brain cancer or, or struggling worse than me. So if me just having this can help them, then, you know, let it be. And it's not like you ever get an email saying, yeah, I did. This is Phil. That, and ladies and gentlemen, was our example of redemptive suffering in the dictionary. Just, yeah. no, dude, your real life example, taking a pain, exactly. Right, right, right. Just, right. Okay. yeah, that's the, that's the real life. So, oh, I stubbed my toe. Okay, somebody has toe cancer or by diabetes and they off you amputate toes. So, um, but the other thing was, and I, I don't think we've talked about this in a different video. It was the B-sides about Jason, what she said to me. I think this is for this. Okay. And then I'll stop talking after I read this paragraph. But um, so recently I, I put it like benignly just for whatever reason recently for, I would say like six months at least, there is not a moment that I am not um, thinking about my wife (laughs) and and uh attracted to her and how beautiful she is like there's just been this thing lately i've told her like jason i don't know what's going on but like i am just like wildly attracted like wildly like you know what i'm trying to say like i got you man okay i think we're all feeling it here you're all feeling and you don't want me to go farther and talking about it so i (laughs) know no (laughs) so anyway i told her like hun i don't i just it's it's unbearable I don't know what to do about it. I need you to help me out. And I was like implying she could help me out. Um, And in whatever way she could think of, I'm just like, just please like give me advice on how to, to temper this because we're married 20 years and I shouldn't be feeling this. And, um, and she, I, I, at one point I said, so you could at least just pray for me. You could just pray for me. Like, if you think about me during the day, pray for me. She's like, all right, I could do that. Um, but it was like a day after that, I had mentioned it again. I'm like, whoo. And she out of nowhere just said, well, you know what you could do with that. Right. And I said, no. And she said, yeah, why don't you just take all of that, that you're feeling for me and offer it up for those who are victims currently of sex trafficking. (laughs) And like, and, and I was just like, just, oh, that is a, that's not what I was expecting. And B, that is so exactly what, this is so exactly pure and holy, like her response. And so that's what I've been trying to do. Not, not well, but that's what I've been trying to do. Like I, like I pray for Gardy every day and like, um, and any girl or boy or man or woman who is, who is in that slavery of a lifestyle, just in those moments where I'm like, I don't know if I, you know, I I'm thinking about my wife. Okay. I'm just going to offer that moment. Um, and then you can talk it's uh, in the catechism paragraph 618 um, it's about the cross being a unique sacrifice of Christ. Um, and it says that it's unique. What, what Jesus did is unique. It's the one mediator t- between God and man, but because in his incarnate divine person, he in some way united himself to every man by being a man, by becoming human, then the possibility of being made partners in a way known to God is offered to all men to being a partner with him in that. So then this is almost it. So he calls us to take up our cross and follow him. Um, And it says, Jesus desires to associate with his redeeming sacrifice, those who are its beneficiaries. So you and I benefit from the cross of Christ. We benefit from it. And so because we do, then he desires to associate us 
with that redeeming sacrifice, with that redemptive suffering. He, he desires to, because he knows we benefit from it. He wants to take us and associate us with the pain that he felt as well. Um, and there's, it ends with a quote from St. Rose of Lima, apart from the cross, there is no other ladder by which we may get to heaven. And so just this idea that like, you know, he desires us for the sake of our soul, but for the sake of every soul that we, that he in his divinity can impact. He desires us to then, in, in, like for me, it was embracing headaches and, you know, libido or whatever. Like he desires us to embrace that and not run from it because he's drawing us into it so that we can then um, offer that to the world. So what St. Rose of Lima is saying is that suffering our lives suffering in our lives is the ladder by which we climb to heaven yeah that's what she was referring to so each rung on that ladder then is a higher form of suffering and i had a, a priest a, a, a priest friend of mine one time told me that you know sometimes the only way god can get us to grow is by putting us in a worse situation than we've been in before hmm. So our lives then are uh, an increasing wrong ladder of suffering until we die and go to heaven, which, which is what Rose is saying. Which pause, if you just tuned in and you heard that line, that's like the typical cliche Catholic, like, yep, you just suffer a little more every day and then you die. And then, like <laughs> yeah. that, that's without understanding the context that's exactly what people think it's like yeah yeah they just they whip themselves they wear hair shirts and then they die and apparently that earns them the gold but like without understanding that because the church is filled with history of people who did that and none of them were sour-faced you know sucking on lemons angry people these were all the most joyous people the yeah. ones who realized no, no no it's because i think that's where it is is it we equate them yeah, the premise is you're equating that that next rung of suffering with with only merely pain, anguish, emptiness, suffering. That's what you're equating it with. But like if you equate it with anything else positive, if you equate it with like, well, that's one step closer to Christ, though. That's one. It's one step closer to him and everything he did. How could that be bad? How could that yeah, be? And especially since. If you don't buy it, the ladder's already been put in front of you. It, every one of us, the ladder's in front of us. The suffering is coming. We can climb the ladder and get closer to God with each rung, or it can just tip over and fall on us. Like nobody gets to step aside from the ladder of suffering. I don't well, care if you're Catholic or not, it's coming. You could even look at it as like that book, Charles Williams' Descent into Hell, is the idea that like, well, it's either a ladder or it's a staircase down. Like it's, it's one of the two. You, you are either ascending or descending. You're not, you're not just neutral because there's no neutral. There's no limbo. Either way, it's there in front yeah, of you. Yeah, yeah. It goes up or down, I guess. Like, yeah. And the thing is, like if you take in, the, You can't choose not to play the game. You're in the game. You're in the game. So like <laughs> if, you, if you choose weak, uh, if, or not even just weak because that sounds like, don't be weak. But like if you choose a step away from what that next mildly uh, more intense <clears throat> offering of self then you do get farther away. You get that minuscule amount farther away than for who you were made to be from your soul to heaven, from offering that. Cause the other thing is that the, the catechism talks about is that, that when one part of the body suffers, the whole, the whole part suffers, but when one part yeah. is joyful, then, cause, because we're not, we're, we're part of an armada. We're not just one ship. We're part yeah. of an armada. So if you do decide to step farther away, then the body of Christ is weakened. It's the witness on the earth. Like the church is witness. And so we have, go ahead. Nope. Well, we have my, people, next, my next thought is the final thought. So you better. Oh, okay. Well, we have, we have witness. We have examples of people, um, whether it's lay people or priests, we have examples right now. And in church history of people who did step farther away and that weakened the body and brought scandal upon the body, the visible body of Christ. Like we, we see what happens when people who should have, been closer to christ aren't and they step down that ladder and then we have the saints who are the people who step closer so just that idea that um i guess for me where it comes down to is uh if if major suffering happens like we've been talking about father chizak over and over if major suffering happens okay i know what to do with it 
but I would only know what to truly do with it if I had experienced it in the smaller ways now. Um, and if those aren't exactly, what's that? I said exactly. Yeah, and so if they're not happening, um, but if you just have this copacetic life, and then you have to choose. Okay, I'm going to force myself out of this because this isn't the reality. This world is not my home. My life is not my own. I the, there is more. I just have to remind myself. Um, and those are the little things that you do. Those are the things where you choose. You know, not just for your kids, but when you offer up any aspect of your life that is uncomfortable. And then I've seen people who you know not just like, so I had headaches. I didn't choose them, but I got headaches. And then I would try to do something with it. But like, then there are people who will just say like, I'm not going to, um, I'm going to skip the extra cup of coffee today that I would normally have every day uh, in, in an effort to mildly get a little splinter of that cross for so-and-so. Um, and that's active. And that's not just hair shirt flagellation stuff, but that's, that's true. That's like, I'm going to take something small. Um, and then, I think that grows in a person till it gets larger and larger. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, for those of you who have um, a hard time reconciling the, the Catholic practice of Lent, let's say of choosing sacrifice. um, What we're not saying tonight is go out and find suffering. What we are saying is that it's going to find you. Right. And you yeah. will not escape it or avoid it. So we don't have to try and find the suffering. What we're saying is that we can be prepared for the suffering that God has for us. That's going to allow us to grow closer to him by making small sacrifices. This is the entire logic of giving up things for Lent. This is the logic of what Nick just said. I'm going to give up this cup of coffee. People understand giving up things for their kids or someone that they love. What we're saying is we should develop a habit of starting to do it for our own and those around us um, betterment for us to become closer to God. So that when the suffering comes, we have practiced it in small ways because we can choose little sacrifices. We can do that. It doesn't take a whole lot of suffering, just like the athlete chooses sacrifices of their time and energy and everything else in order to achieve a goal, we can choose that question. So that, that's what we are saying. Yeah. Well, yeah, because so if somebody was saying like, okay, well, it's like the old like Noah thing, but like, listen, this natural disaster is going to happen. We know it, uh, but you have plenty of time. So just get ready. That's basically what the church is saying in a certain sense, because there's a certain day in which um, your actions on this earth are reckoned. And, and what you have done with the tick of the clock and every beat of your heart and every breath in your lung, you, you're, it's required of you. What did you do with it? Um, and it's not like it, by an angry God. It's like, listen, how much did we spread this love and this goodness? Uh, when you knew this was coming, you knew this day would come. Um, and the church just says, no, but the joy of doing it now. Like the joy, the joy. In that, and to be honest, like, and this is dumb. This just happened today, the whole onion ring thing. But for me, like... There was, there was an internal and everything happens in a heartbeat, but there was an internal moment of just bliss when I was like, Davey, come here. Like, I, I see you looking at my onion rings. You can have another one. Like d- there was like genuine something eternal in that, which is so dumb. It's an onion ring, but like at the same time, it's not like it's, it's that can, that can, um, that can proliferate and, and become more and more in your life. And that can begin to bring life in you and then those around you, I guess. And, and in the people you never know until the end, until the eschaton, when you, you finally get to see, I actually know that time that headache was for her. That headache was for him. You know, this was for them. And this is what you did. Um, I, years ago, when I'm we first do, what's that? I said, that's what I'm looking for. Oh, I know. Oh my gosh. I was, I, I was, I think it'd be neat to see, even in the moment, you know, if you go to mass and you, I thought it'd be cool to do a video sometime of, you know, during communion or in the lead up to communion, um, have like a congregation at mass and the camera is like going to each, like it zooms in on this couple here and they fought all the way to church and their marriage is like right on the edge. And then you have somebody who's struggled with, you know, porn all week or whatever. And you have somebody who's this and that and all these brokenness. Um, and you have people who've got it great and they're strong as well. But then as they all receive the Eucharist, somehow seeing how, outside of time and outside of logic 
through the mystery of God that, you know, so-and-so like me and my family who are doing just fine. We come in and we receive the Eucharist and every one of us who receives strengthens, you know, the other five people in the pews over here and um, their weakness is lessened because of it and how it all ends up working together in a body because of it. I think that'd be neat to see. We don't get to see it now, but it would be neat to be able to see. Yeah. Yeah. I can't wait. Yeah. Right. You know, you got to suffer. Oh, look at my glass disappears. Whoa. I'm holding the night sky. Um, a toast okay. that we can learn to suffer well and be reminded to make little sacrifices for the people that we love and get out of the habits of self-centeredness. Cheers. Cheers. Ooh, that was all maple syrup. This is Salty Caramel.